Hi, uh, my name is Raja Sivaram Krishnan. I'm a software engineer at Juniper Networks. Um, previously, I was at Contrail Systems, which was acquired by Juniper at the end of last year. I will, I will be talking about the Juniper Contrail solution. And then I'll go into details of the Contrail V-router, which is one of the components of the, of the solution. And then talk about what changes we made to optim optimize performance in the Contrail solution. And finally, I'll talk about service chaining and policy-based forwarding, which are features of the, uh, of the solution. So the Contrail solution is a, is a network virtualization solution. It allows you to create virtual networks that are independent of the physical network. So you could provision new applications or migrate existing applications without having to touch the physical network infrastructure, without having to rework any security policies, load balancing, things like that. Any changes in the physical network do not affect the virtual networks. And there's full isolation of, of the tenants. So failures in one tenant or misconfigurations in one tenant do not affect other tenants. And addresses are unique, are private per tenant. And failures in the virtual domain don't propagate into the physical domain. And we are able to peer directly with a gateway router in a cloud data center. So we don't need a separate gateway node in order to be able to bridge between the virtual world and the physical world. And finally, our code is open source. We just released our product this week. And what we've open sourced is the production version of our code. So we don't have a separate open source train and a production train. So there's just one train of code which we have open sourced. And I'll have a pointer to the code at the end of this presentation. So in the next slide, we'll look at where the, the Contrail solution fits in in a cloud data center. So typically, we have an orchestrator, a system like OpenStack or CloudStack. And the orchestrator has a compute API, a storage API, and network API. So the compute API is responsible for spawning virtual machines on the compute nodes in the data center. The storage API provisions storage for those VMs. And the network API is responsible for setting up the communication between the VMs. So the orchestrator talks to the Contrail configuration system, what's marked as Contrail VNS, they're using REST APIs. And the configuration system talks to the vRouter module, which is a kernel module that runs on the compute nodes. It can also talk to the gateway router, which could be a Juniper MX or a router from other vendors directly. And it can also talk to service nodes, which could be virtual, running inside virtual machines, or they could be physical boxes that implement services. In the next slide, we'll look at the components of the solution. We have the orchestrator talking to the configuration node, and there could be multiple configuration nodes. And the configuration nodes generate config that's consumed by the control nodes. And we could have a federation of control nodes talking to each other using IBGP. And the control nodes talk to the data forwarding elements, which is the kernel module inside the compute nodes, using XMPP. The control node also talks to the service nodes and the gateway node using BGP and NetConf in the future. We also have an analytics engine, which allows for monitoring traffic, debugging, troubleshooting problems, looking at traffic trends, top talkers, that kind of thing, which we won't be focusing on in this presentation. In terms of the physical topology, so we, a typical da cloud data center would have leaf and spine switches, which have an IGP between them. And then there are gateway routers, which talk to the spine switches. And then there are racks of servers. And these could be the servers where the virtual machines run. And some of these racks could also be used to run elements of the Contrail solution. So this could be the configuration, control, control, control protocol, analytics, and the UI. 
this slide illustrates how we integrate with OpenStack, for example, to create a virtual machine. Horizon, which is the OpenStack UI, would be used to create a virtual machine. It talks to Nova, which is the compute API in OpenStack. And that invokes the Nova scheduler to decide which compute node the virtual machines should be spawned on. On that compute node, there is an OpenStack element which talks to the Contrail agent in order to provision that virtual machine. It also talks to a quantum plugin which talks to the Contrail configuration node, which in turn talks to the control node to create an interface for that virtual machine. So everything in blue in that picture is from OpenStack, and the parts that are in green are part of the Contrail solution. And finally, the control node talks to the agent using XMPP. And one thing I wanted to point out was our solution is entirely based on standard protocols. We use BGP, MPLS, XMPP, and our encapsulation is MPLS over GRE. So these are all standards, and we should be able to, able to interoperate with any vendor's implementation of these protocols. Um, we'll get to that. There's a slide about that. Okay. And at some point, there's a, a yes. So before we get to the, the kernel module, this is just a brief description of the control plane. So in this picture, we have two servers with a virtual machine being spawned on each one. And when a VM is spawned, the agent that is running on that server advertises that VM to the control control node, which is running the control protocol. And it advertises that with the address of the server and the label that's associated with that VM. And similarly, for the VM spawned on server 2, that is advertised to the control node. And this information is exchanged between control nodes and then sent to all compute nodes in the same virtual network. So if VM1 wants to send a packet to VM2, the packet would then be encapsulated using a GRE, a GRE header and MPLS header, and the outer headers, which contains the source and destination of the, of the servers themselves. No, it's not. So actually, this slide talks about that. It's, it's a kernel module on the compute node. Yes. Control node and the virtual router. There's a protocol between the control node and the virtual router. So that is XMPP. I'm sorry, what is SP and RP? Yes, so we borrowed heavily from MPLS L3 VPNs. So a lot of the concepts that we use in this solution are borrowed from, from there. So in that sense, yes, that is true. So we support it on CentOS, Ubuntu, and, um, and Fedora, and also on Zen. So on the compute node, we have a, a kernel module, which is the vRouter module. And it talks to a user space agent. And the, the virtual machines have their tap interfaces, which are interfaces that the vRouter module knows about. And inside the module, we have the notion of separate VRFs for each tenant. This is, again, borrowing from L3 VPN concepts. And each VRF has its own forwarding table. And we also support flows to implement forwarding policy. So there is a receive handler that um, 
in 3.x kernels, there is a handler that you can define, and we trap packets using that. No. No. So it's just a different API. In older versions, there's a bridge hook that we tap into. And that's how packets enter the kernel module. And from the tap interface, they enter, um, again, there's a handler that you can hijack for the tap interface, and that's how they enter the. Yes, correct. So as I mentioned there, so vRouter is an alternative to the Linux bridge or, or the OBS module in the kernel. <coughs> An analogous question. Uh, I assume that IP tables isn't going to work as it normally does if you have the vRouter module installed? Um, so what, I'm not that familiar with IP tables, so. Well, I, I, I'm just asking because your third bullet point up there says vRouter performs networking services like security policies, NAT mirroring, and load balancing. Well, we already have a lot of those facilities in the kernel. You know, we have traffic classification, IP tables for NAT, that sort of thing. Uh, I assume this sh short circuits all of right, that. Right, right. It doesn't go through all of those. OK. And you said you open sourced all of this. Are you maintaining this in uh, an upstream pre, or are you maintaining it out of tree currently? So we have our own GitHub repository. OK. Thanks. <coughs> Is it VRF? So are you using the VRF patch or the network namespace feature for the different tenants? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? For the VRF, are you using the Linux VRF patch or are you using Linux network namespace? We have implemented it ourselves inside the kernel module. So we have our own forwarding tables. We have our own uh, routes, next stops, interfaces, VRFs that we have implemented inside the, inside the kernel module. No. Yes. 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 I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Not at the moment. We have our own APIs. And what the APIs allow you to do is to add routes, next hops, interfaces. And we also allow addition of flows, but it's not the same as the OVS API. So when you say you have your own API, that means you can have public, available kernel modules, or the implementation, and public? So all our code is open source. So Right, and th that's an excellent question. Um, so we've borrowed a lot from the MPLS L3 VPN concepts. And the underlying primitives there are routes, next hops, MPLS labels. And those are different from using flows. And that's the fundamental reason why we decided to do this on, their own, on our own. That's correct. Can I comment? Um, uh, most of you don't know me, but I, I started Ypsilon Networks way back when. We kind of invented flow switching. And we totally had our asses kicked by the MPLS guys who were not doing per flow stuff. So pay attention. If, again, you're having all these layer four flow scaling problems. This could be a very serious competitor. So this slide, we look at how packet forwarding happens. So we have a VM that's sending a packet to a VM running on another compute node. So the first thing the VM does is it sends an ARP. And that is trapped by vRouter. And vRouter responds with its own MAC in the ARP response. And then the VM sends the IP packet 
and based on which tap interface the packet arrived on, we would look up in that VRF. And the result of the lookup would be the IP address of the destination server and the MPLS label to use. So we would encapsulate that inner IP in MPLS and GRE, and then the outer IP where the destination would be the other server's address. So once the packet reaches that server, the V router module would decapsulate the GRE header. And then based on the MPLS label, it knows which VM on that machine needs to receive that packet. So it goes up on that tap interface and, and finally reaches the VM. This slide shows the APIs and the interfaces that the vRouter module has. It talks to the physical interface and also the tap interfaces to the virtual machines. And any packet that should not be consumed by vRouter is sent to the Linux network stack using another interface. And vRouter also handles some packets like DHCP. When the VM sends a DHCP request, the vRouter module sends it over to user space and the DHCP is satisfied from, from user space. And we also have a Netlink API. And the API includes things like addition of routes, next hops, new interfaces, getting statistics, adding flows, things like that. In the next slide, we'll look at the changes that we made to optimize for performance. Yes, so we have a user space agent, and it talks to the control plane. So whenever a new VM is instantiated, the control plane tells the agent that here's a new VM. And based on that, we would then program using this API. Yes, everything is open sourced. So to measure performance, we have a setup with two servers. And the servers are connected by a 10 gig link with a 1500 byte MTU. Each server has two CPU sockets, six cores. This is Xeon running at 2.5 gigahertz. And we are not depending on any of the segmentation capabilities of the NIC. So we want to be able to handle the lowest common denominator. So we do segmentation in software. And with that, we get a baseline performance of three gigabits per second using MPLS over GRE when we run a TCP streaming test between the VMs. We then implemented GRO inside the vRouter module. And with that, the throughput improved to about 5 gigabits per second. But what we saw was that the CPU that was receiving the packets was the bottleneck. It was doing all the processing. And also, the vHost processing to actually send the packet into the VM was also usually happening on the same CPU. So we decided to move that part to a different CPU. And to do that, we used RPS. So with GRE, most NICs are not able to look inside the inner packet. So all flows between the same pair of hosts end up on the same queue. Even if the NIC is multi-queue capable, it still goes to the same queue. And this is a scenario which RPS handles pretty well. So we did RPS on the outer header. So if the packet arrives on CPU core 0, we would do RPS and send it to CPU 1. And all the vRouter processing, decapsulating the packet and doing GRO happens on CPU 1. And with that, we saw that we were able to get about 7 gigabits per second. But the bottleneck was still CPU 1 because all the processing was happening there. So we did RPS again on the inner header. So the packet arrives on CPU 0. All the physical interface processing happens on CPU 0. It then goes to CPU 1 where all the vRouter processing happens, GRO happens. And then it goes to CPU 2, where all the vHost processing to actually send the packet in, into the destination VM happens. And with that, we are able to get about 9.1 gigabits per second, which is pretty close to line rate. And we're getting bidirectional throughput of about 13.5 gigabits per second. There is some variability in the performance based on how, how the VM is scheduled. If, if the VM is scheduled on, on the same CPU as 
the ones that are doing the packet processing work, then the throughput goes down a little bit. But on, on average, we see something between, between 8 and 9 gigabit, gigabits per second on a, on a 10 gigabit link. Because we're doing RPS twice, there is some impact to latency. And we measured that with a request response test. And we saw that the latency went down by less than 10%. CPU consumption on both the sender and the receiver is about 120%. So this doesn't count the CPU consumed by the guest itself. It's the CPU for handling the packets and the vhost thread in the kernel. If we change the encapsulation to MPLS over UDP, then the CPU consumption on the receiver is about 15% less. And this is because the verification of the checksum can be done by the NIC if it's UDP. But for MPLS over GRE, the NICs are not capable of verifying the checksum. No, a single stream would, let's say the packet arrives on core zero. From there, it would go to core one and then to core two. So even for a single stream, yes, it, it, it does have an impact. I see that we're almost out of time. Um, it's just a couple, but I won't go into details here. So when we start talking about performance, I figure the, the meat and the topic. Yeah, so we support service chaining. So you can have multiple services. A packet can be sent from a VM to a service, which could be a firewall from there to a load balancer, and then, to, a, and then to, a, to the destination VM. And this is all orchestrated by the control plane using BGP. And we also support policy-based forwarding, so I won't go into details of this. So we have a flow table where you can have policies to accept, deny, do NAT on the packets, things like that. And most of what I presented today is work done by other people in the Contrail team, so I want to acknowledge that. And our source code is on opencontrail.org. That's all I have. Thank you.